Hello and welcome to Freed Indeed Live. I'm your host, Kevin J.N. Hughes, and don't worry, this is just a heating pad. Um, I have found that it helps to kind of soothe the ongoing uh, issue I'm having with pain. So I wanted to do a quick video for you guys, um, continuing on the series of going through this The Forgotten Medicine by Archimandrite Seraphim Alexiev. This book is super awesome, really excellent resource on confession and on encouraging us to uh to to find God in confession. And and so I um it's been a while since I have continued on with this series and I want to make sure I bring I want to make sure I continue this we're actually about halfway through the book uh as we so we may as well keep going on this series and get uh get these precious resources out to everybody um I think that Oh, this book is so awesome, so important, and I am glad to be able to be presenting these things. Um, so as usual, I will, for the most part, be going through the book, uh, just be going through the, rel the section that we're covering today. Um, if I have any thoughts to share, I will interject them throughout. But otherwise, I'll be reading uh, Archbishop Alexiev's, or, or sorry, Archimandrite Alexiev's words. So this is an important section, uh, Chapter Four: Objections to Confession. And he says, how great must be our wickedness that we do not turn to confession, not only because we forget about it, but we do not practice it even when we know about it. For what could be more Im imprudent than this? Confession is so important to us sinners that we must boldly say that there is no salvation for us without confession. Abba Isaiah expresses the same thought. If there were no repentance, nobody could be saved, just as baptism cleanses us from original sin and all sins committed prior to baptism. So repentance involving confession of our sins cleanses us from all lawlessness committed after baptism. Why we do not confess because we have objections to confession but what are our objections here are some of the main ones objection one i am so sinful god cannot forgive my sins and you'd be surprised how often i uh how often i get phone calls to the ministry from people saying just this back, uh, back when i owned uh uh the bookstore I remember one time a lady called the bookstore and asked if it was possible for God to forgive her because she had lived a very sinful life and um, she was feeling the weight of, of her sins and asked if God could forgive her. And I walked her through that. So that's... So this is one of the objections people have to the idea of confession is, well, I'm so sinful. How could God possibly forgive me? Uh, our, and Archimandrite, uh, our Archimandrite Seraphim says the following. I do not believe this. That is why there is no use for me to go to confession. Um. But if a man repents sincerely, any sin can be forgiven him. The power of repentance is based on the power of God. Uh, the, 
the doctor is all powerful and the medicine given by him is all powerful, says Bishop Ignatius Bryanakov. St. John Chrysostom, pondering the miraculous results of sincere repentance, says, Repentance is a medicine which destroys sin. It is a heavenly gift. Sorry, guys. I feel a sneeze coming. <laughs> It is a heavenly gift. It is a miraculous force, which through the grace of God conquers the might and strictness of the law. It accepts all and transforms all. It does not reject the fornicator and does not send away the adulterer. It is not disgusted with the drunkard and does not loathe the idolater. It does not neglect the slanderer, and it does not persecute the reviler, nor the haughty man. It regenerates everyone, because it is a furnace that purifies from sin. The wound and the medicine, these are sin and repentance. Do not tell me I have sinned much. How can I save myself? You cannot, but God can. He can do it so that all your sins will be destroyed. Listen carefully to my words. That your God may destroy all sins in a manner there is neither a spot nor a trace left of them. And as he restores your health, so he presents you with the righteousness which frees you from the death penalty he gives you the righteousness, and the one who sinned he makes equal to the one who has not, because he destroys and makes disappear all the sin as if it had never been. So he casts your sin as far as the east is from the west, as scripture says. So there is no, there's no one so sinful that God cannot save them. The only one whose sin is unforgivable is the one who does not repent. So always repent. Don't make the excuse that you think you're too sinful to go to confession. God can forgive you in confession. But is it possible, you will say, for the one who repents to be saved? It is perfectly possible but I've spent my entire life in sin. If I repent, will I still be saved? Of course. How do we know that? From the very love of your God for man. Am I relying on your repentance to destroy your heavy sins? If you were to rely only on your repentance, then indeed you should tremble. But the mercy of God unites with repentance, and the mercy of God has no limit. Words cannot express his kindness. Your wickedness has an end, but the medicine for it is boundless. Your wickedness is human wickedness, but God's mercy is ineffable. So have hope that it will exceed your many sins. Imagine a spark which falls into the sea. Will it start a fire? Will it appear again? Sin is to God's love for man what that spark is to the sea. Not even that, but something much smaller. The sea, however big it may be, has an end. But God's love for man is limitless. Another object. So this is objection number two. Why should I go to confession if I have no special sins? Mm. Okay, no special sins. So this is kind of... The opposite of the last objection. The last objection was uh, somebody saying that he was too sinful. This person says that he's not uh, not so sinful that he needs confession. He doesn't really need to go to confession, right? Because he isn't that bad. So what does Archimandrite Seraphim have to say about that? Let those who have murdered, stolen, raped, or committed some other grave sin go to confession, but not I. This objection comes this objection to confession is the complete opposite of the first. There, the man, because of the oppressing realization of his own wickedness, does not believe that he can be forgiven. 
Here there is a lack of realization of one's wickedness. I have no special sins. But is this really so? When a man stays in a closed room for a long time, he gets used to the bad air in it and does not feel how unpleasant it is. But if someone comes in from the outside, he will not be able to stand the stench of the room and will run away. Let those who say, I have no special sins, answer whether they have Christ in their hearts. He likes to inhabit pure hearts. But are their hearts pure? Hardly. They imagine that they are pure, but imagination is not reality. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth of God is not in us. 1 John 1, eight. And where there is a lie, Christ is not. Then what should we do? Let us confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. The Holy Fathers teach us that it is very hard for a man to see his sins. They explain this with the blindness caused by the devil. Abba Isaiah says, when a man separates from the one on his left side, in other words, from communion, with the demons following their suggestions, then he will see his sins against God. And then he will see his sins against God in their fullness, and he will know Jesus. But... A man cannot see his sins until he separates himself from them through a separation filled with labor and distress. Those who have reached this condition have found tears and prayers as they remember about their sly friendship with the passions. They do not dare to look toward God and live constantly with a broken spirit if it were easy to see our sins saint ephraim the syrian would not have prayed lord enable me to see my transgressions neither would father john of Kunch of kronstadt have said this is truly a gift of god to be able to see your sins in their multitude and in all of their loathsomeness it turns out that those who think that they do not have any great sins are actually blind. They must pray for God to enable them to perceive their sins and to save themselves from the extremely fatal spiritual delusion that they do not have any particular sins. If Even if their sins are as small as specks of dust, if they are not cleaned with constant confession, then they will pile up and will dirty the room of the heart so that the heavenly guest cannot enter there. The small sins are indeed often more dangerous than the greatest crime because the latter weighs heavily on the conscious and conscience and insists on being atoned for, confessed, settled, and erased, while the small sins do not weigh so much on the soul, but they have this perilous property of making it insensitive to the grace of God and indifferent to salvation. Fewer people have perished from ferocious wild beasts than from small microbes invisible to the naked eye. By being considered insignificant, the small sins are passed by without any attention. They're easily forgotten, but they create in man the most terrible habit, the habit of sinning and of dulling his moral consciousness. Thus, the wretched sinner comes to deceive himself that he is not so sinful, that everything is all right with him when he is both a miserable and abject slave of sin. Small sins create a true stagnation in the spiritual life of man, just as the wall clock stops because of the accumulation of fine dust, so the spiritual pulse gradually dies out under the thick layer of accumulated small sins. So it's really important that we see that um, 
whether we've sinned in grievous ways or whether we've sinned in relatively small ways, all of our sin separates us from God. And if we aren't dealing with it in confession, then we're going to keep having the same problems. It's only once you deal with your sins in confession that you're actually going to see progress and be able uh, to move forward in holiness. I, uh, sorry guys, I have to turn on a, another light here. I, I need to see a little bit better. Um, I hope that that's not gonna be too unpleasant for you guys, for anybody watching, but a third man says, all this is true, but why should I confess when I know that tomorrow I will sin again? Is there any point to such confession? I see that one should confess only if one were to sin no more after that. This is an interesting one because I'm reminded of a, uh, I'm reminded of a discussion that I had actually with a relative of mine. Uh, because I cleaned the toilet and I, when I clean, when I, uh, when I clean the toilet, I clean the, the handle as well. And uh, he saw me doing this and, and he was kind of teasing me that, well, you're just going to get the, you, you're just going to get that dirty again. Why bother? Um, and I remember kind of teasing him back that by that logic, we should never clean anything because everything is just going to get dirty again, right? This objection to confession contains both something which is true and something which is not. The truth is that the desire not to sin in anymore after confession, but we are feeble humans and cannot attain right away such a firmness which will make falling into voluntary sins impossible. If we cannot reach such steadfastness in virtue right away, should we surrender to vice? Or if we stop confessing, which is better, to roll in the mud of the spiritual swamp or to pick yourself up after each fall and go on with the hope that someday you may reach the solid and beautiful shore of virtue. If you do not confess, you remain in the mud. If you do confess, you pick yourself up from the mud and clean yourself. But why should I get up if tomorrow I will fall again, you say? When you fall again, then get up again. And each day begin all over again. This is undoubtedly better than falling out of habit, uh, out of the habit of getting up. A young monk complained to the great ascetic Abba Sisios, Sisois. Abba, what should I do? I have fallen. The elder answered, Get up. And the monk said, I got up and I fell again. And the elder replied, Get up again. But the young monk asked, For how long shall I get up when I fall? And the Abba answered, Until your death. This is the Christian life. We fall, we get back up. We fall, we get back up. Um, scripture says there is no one living who does not sin. And, but we don't give in to sin. We don't live in sin. We keep getting back up. We keep returning to God's mercy. And part of that is confession. Every time we sin, we confess. This wise dialogue should be remembered by all of us who want to change, but deceived by the devil, constantly return to our previous sins. Every time we fall into transgressions, we must get up. The getting up, this is confession. But why should we play at falling and getting up? Asks someone. Because it is not a game, but it is a struggle in which there is much sense. If we as feeble humans fall but get up again, there is a great probability that death will find us when we are standing. Then, when we are saved, we, but if we do not intend to get up, death will surely find us while we lie in the mud, and we shall be lost forever. St. John Chrysostom says repentance opens the heavens up for man and takes him to paradise. It overcomes the devil. 
Have you sinned? Do not despair. If you sin every day, then offer repentance every day. For when there are rotten parts in old houses, we replace them with new ones, and we do not stop caring for the house. In the same way, you should reason for yourself. If today you have defiled yourself with sin, immediately clean yourself with repentance. For the washing away of bodily dirtiness, God has given us water. For the washing away of spiritual foulness, God has given us the sacrament of confession. Every man, when he dirties his hands, washes them. No one says, I will not wash my hands anymore because I will just get them dirty again. But why is it that many people say, I will not go to confession, for I shall sin again tomorrow? It is clear that the enemy of our salvation is enticing us not to wash our souls when he can gain power over them. But we must not give in to such satanic suggestions. We should confess frequently because frequent washing produces a taste for cleanliness. Leave your house unswept, uncleaned, and unventilated for one year. Will it not turn into a pigsty? Now think about what the soul of man is like when he has not cleansed himself through confession. Some, some not only for one year, but even for twenty. Fourth, um, I am confessing before God what need is there for me to go to the priest. So here's the a uh, favorite objection of uh, many of our Protestant friends. God has ordained the priest to administer the Holy Sacrament so that we can receive through them the heavenly all-saving grace. Confession is a sacrament too. If you confess before God, you do well because you are moving your conscience, remembering your sins, and maybe even shedding tears for them. Yet you do not receive God's grace of forgiveness through that. As when you sit and think how during the never-ending day of the heavenly kingdom, those who have pleased God partake of the unfathomable for us heavenly communion, you do not partake of it in reality, no matter how moved you may be by your thoughts, until you accept the visible holy communion. So, too, until you go to the priest whom Jesus himself has given the power to bind and loose, no matter how much you confess before God, you do not receive forgiveness for your sins because God himself has con condescended to say to the priest, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. John 20, verse 23. Besides confession, so why do we go to a priest? Because it's biblical, for one thing. Um, besides confession before a priest is an enormous instructive meaning it humbles us it cures our pride it makes us blush savagely and it instills in us shame and fear and thus protects us from future sins when we sin we sin against the omnipotent god but we are not ashamed before him because we do not see him in the same manner when we confess before God, we do so easily because we do not see him. And it is as if we were talking to ourselves, but with shyness, we confess before the priest, the man who has submitted to the church order to confess before a priest will hardly dare to repeat his sins when he thinks of having to reveal them again during confession. Jesus Christ has ordered very wisely that our repentance should be done before a priest who is God's witness. How can the priest absolve sins, you ask? He can since God has ordained it so. But the priest himself, it, is he not a sinful man? If he is a sinner, what it, do you lose from that? He is sinful for himself, and he will answer to God for his own sins. The holy sacrament administered by him does not cease to be active for you because of his sinfulness if you accept them with faith and humility. Does the ray of the sun get dirty when it falls upon the mud? In the same way, God's grace is not less because it is transmitted by a priest who is himself muddied with sin. He himself may be denied grace on judgment day because of his sinfulness, 
but you, accepting through him God's grace, will not deprive you of it, though you yourself are also unworthy. But will the priest not give away the secret of my confessed sins? No, no priest has the right to tell that which he has heard during confession. He has to take the secret of your confession to his grave. So do not worry about the shame of your sinfulness that it may be announced in society, for this will not happen. But remember that if you avoid confession because of zeal for your own honor, you will shame yourself. If you are ashamed to admit your weakness before man, everyone will begin talking about them. Such is the spiritual law. People sense our weakness no matter how diligently we hide them. But if you confess them before one man, God, because of your humility, before this single witness will cover you with his grace before many. And this is true. This is true not only of um, this is true not only of human things. I've seen this many times that people be that because of confession, people uh, find that they're that other people no longer notice their own shortcomings as much. Um, but also a bigger issue is that uh, the demons themselves cannot see sins that we've confessed. Uh, the demons themselves are not able to pierce that veil. Uh, however, if you are shielding your name before your confessor, your authority will collapse before all. Repent only with one man, and your confession will teach you to struggle with your passions. Even if you are really fighting against them, the multitude of people will not find out about them. You, with God's help, will be healed before you have shamed yourself. But if you do not want to be healed through confession, then you will both expose your name to abuse and then be disgraced before the whole universe on the last judgment. You know, it's interesting. Um, he said before the whole universe on the last judgment. Um, many people believe that on the last day, uh, Anthony Hokema talks about this in his uh, book on eschatology. And Seventh-day Adventists actually teach this as a doctrine. But uh, many, many people believe that Scripture teaches that uh, on the last day, all of our, all of, all of humanity's sins will be made revealed to all, uh, sort of broadcasted. But uh, and and that's true. That there's biblical reference to this. That's why people say this. They're not just making this up. But who whose sins you loose on earth are loosed in heaven, and whose sins you bind on earth are bound in heaven. So if we go to the priest and we confess our sins, then. They're gone. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. And they, even on the last judgment, they will not be brought up again. So, all, so when we try to hide our reputation, when we try to hide to, to, to protect our own reputation, what's more important? Hiding from one man, the priest, who's going to forget your sins anyway? Or hiding on the last day of judgment when all sins are made manifest and everyone, when everyone's works are revealed. I don't want my sins to be revealed with uh, on the last day. I don't want to have that exposed. I would rather be exposed in confession uh, with humility. A fifth man says, I am going to the priest and have him read the prayer of absolution for me. This is the most sacrilegious abuse of confession. What does the prayer of absolution mean? It means a prayer for the absolving of sins. The Christian goes to the priest and without confessing asks him 
Father, say the prayer of absolution for me, or forgiving prayer. The priest puts the stole on the head of the penitent and forgives him for the lawlessness which he has not confessed but merely hidden. Stop, you servant of God, what are you doing? Do you know what sins are hiding in this soul that you forgive them so carelessly? What a responsibility you carry before God. If a deadly sin is being hidden from you and you so thoughtlessly allow the Christian to partake of Holy Communion, you not you do not speed up the death of the soul. Do you not know the words of the Holy Apostle Paul? Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.27 why do you test the believer? Why do you let him eat and drink to his eternal condemnation? Excuse me. Why do you give the sacrament to the unrepentant sinner? Judas, too, took communion, excuse me, together with the holy apostles at the Last Supper. But because he was an unrepentant sinner, instead of God's grace, Satan himself went into him. Do you want to make a second, Judas? out of the careless one who approaches Christ without confession, only with an absolving prayer, it is better to refuse communion to the unprepared man until he repents than to give him fire and condemnation. So, um, I don't think this happens anymore. I think that that's a uh, old practice that, stopped happening but yes there used to be a practice um that would sometimes happen where people would go to a priest and have him read the prayer of absolution um but like i said that doesn't really happen anymore priests there's no priests that do that um and it it's not like all priests used to do this it was just uh this was something that happened for a time uh, th there were people who were corrupt who would do this, but you know, yeah, the wheat and the tares, man. Um, but so those are the five objections. That fifth one is really more directed at clergy. Um, our command right seraphim is calling out clergy who were doing this bad practice in that place and time. But yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, God willing, that will never start up again. But yes, if you are clergy, then certainly don't uh, give people the prayer of absolution without them confessing. Now, I know that in the United States, sometimes this happens, that there's a language barrier, um, and sometimes in other countries too, I'm sure, but there's a language barrier to where, uh, say, you have an American priest but then some of the people in the congregation don't speak English. They speak only whatever language uh, from the old country. So then uh, I think that a situation like this, so to avoid that, what you do is you still have confession. You still let them actually confess. And then you read the prayer of absolution. And I get it. You won't hear what they're saying because they don't speak English. Um, obviously, it's better if they can confess to a priest who does speak their language. But I, I get that that might not be possible. But at least hear and give them a chance to actually confess and then uh, speak the words of absolution. I know you can't counsel them, which is super important. Confession does include counseling um and you can't really counsel them if you don't speak their language but you can at least give them that absolution um and that's another thing by the way uh one more thing about confession is that it includes counseling so um not only does confession absolve you from sins but you can gain new insights into how to fight sin and you can gain new insights into what you're doing and how to change your ways. So those are all reasons to partake of confession and hopefully this overcomes any uh, frivolous objections that people may have to objection. So thank you very much for watching. Please do share this with your friends, especially your friends
who are objecting to going to confession so that they too can be freed indeed. God bless.